Warning, spoilers ahead. Dr. Fate lectured Blackout and Manerf. So why did a surprise guest come to Chit Chat? And who's the real hero in this movie? If you saw the 2019 film Shazam, then you may recall the scene in which Billy Batson is first transported to the Rock of Eternity to meet the wizard Shazam. My name is Shazam. Wait, for real? As Billy tries to make sense of what's going on, Shazam explains that he is the last of the Council of Wizards, and he is looking for someone pure of heart to pass his powers onto in order to protect humanity from the seven deadly sins. The reason he has to be so picky is because the last time the power was passed to someone, it didn't go so well. We learn a bit more about that in this film, because Black Adam, or Teth Adam, as he's originally called, is the reason Shazam has to be careful about who gets the powers. Bestow with the stamina of Shu, the speed of Horus, the strength of Armon, the wisdom of Zehuti, the powers of Artin, and the courage of Mahan, Adam used his incredible powers to seek revenge on the ruler of Kondark, instead of being the hero the Seven Wizards intended. The story of Black Adam is about the character gradually getting to a place mentally where he can embody some of the attributes the wizards were looking for. However, since he was not the one they initially chose to wield the power, he will never become a traditional hero. 5,000 years after Teth Adam brought down Onkot, a woman named Adriana Tomas releases him from his prison by speaking the words engraved on the seal trapping him in some kind of limbo state. The second he shows up, Adam goes on a lightning-spitting rampage as he kills the soldiers coming at him with guns and tanks and all sorts of useless weapons. Since the legends say that Seth Adam will return when Kondark needs him most, everyone naturally assumes that this super strong guy who looks like the statue they built thousands of years ago is there to rescue them from Intergang. Unfortunately, they couldn't be more wrong. The only reason Adam has killed those men is because they were in his way and they were attacking him. He has no intention of saving anyone. This doesn't fit with all the legends they've heard, and there's a good reason for that. This isn't the Teth Adam the wizards initially chose to have their powers. They selected the boy Harut, who was the son of the man currently carrying the name Teth Adam. Harut gave his powers to his father to protect him, but was assassinated shortly after. Therefore, the man flying around modern-day Kondark is a broken father who's lost the only thing he ever loved, and who sees his own existence as a curse. The Justice Society of America is called in to take Adam into custody because he poses a threat to the safety of the United States and every other country in the world if he were to suddenly decide he'd like to rule the world. Black Adam's rage and thirst for vengeance release the seven deadly sins upon the world, resulting in six of the seven wizards getting obliterated and entire civilizations being wiped out. Despite being the good guys, the Justice Society has inherited Amanda Waller's sanctimonious attitude when it comes to what heroes can can and cannot do. Aside from continuously lecturing Adam on proper heroic etiquette, they also just assume that the people of Kondok are also going to step aside for the Justice Society. Why? Because they're the ones with the superpowers. Therefore, they know best. You think yourself a hero, but you would let these criminals go free. Heroes don't kill people. However, this is a country that has been invaded and occupied for years, and not once did the Justice Society come to help. Only after the JSA can learn to work with Adam and the citizens of Kondok are they able to get any work done. We can see that at the end, when instead of charging in and destroying things, Atom Smasher and Cyclone use their powers to work in tandem with the people. When Black Adam opens, we're given a very detailed breakdown of everything that went down in Kondok in the year 2600 BC, thanks to a voiceover from the character Armand Tomas. He tells us about how a magical element called the Eternium can be found in Kondok, and that an ancient ruler had his slaves dig for the element in order to forge the crown of Sabak so he could wield ultimate power. However, Black Adam took the crown and destroyed his empire. In this prologue, we see her root with an old man, but once we get the full story, we realize that the old man was actually the boy's father and he looks remarkably like Black Adam. While a tad confusing at first, this actually demonstrates just how much of Kondok's past and resources have been co-opted by outside forces over the centuries. When the Justice Society explains they've had access to ancient texts that say Black Adam was a destroyer instead of a hero, Amon's mother Adriana doesn't believe them. It is very likely that people have been coming to Kondok and stealing from it so much that even its own history is incomplete. Therefore, when we see Amon's story, what we're seeing is his interpretation of events, not the events as they actually unfolded. 
This stands as yet another reason why Khan Dark needs a protector to keep the history intact. I kneel before no one. When the truth comes out that Black Adam isn't the hero of legend, he agrees to go with the JSA to be locked up forever. He doesn't want these powers anymore, since he never felt worthy of them to begin with. He makes the JSA promise that after he saves Shazam and transforms back to his original form, they will never allow him to speak the word again. He is tired of carrying this burden and welcomes the idea of being free of it, even if that means being locked up. They take him to an underwater Task Force X prison run by Amanda Waller. She, of course, is the director of Argus, an agency that engages in numerous clandestine missions across the globe to make sure superhumans do not threaten the security of the United States. Task Force X is a division of Argus, where imprisoned villains in the DC Universe are used to carry out many of those missions in exchange for time off for their sentences. You might remember them better as the Suicide Squad. Uh, we consider that term degrading. The official term is Task Force X. When the members of the JSA arrive, they're greeted by Amelia Harcourt. Fans of the HBO series Peacemaker will likely remember her as an NSA agent, working for Waller in that series and in the film The Suicide Squad. She points out that the gods were meant to be humanity's heroes, but humanity seems to be the one always burying them. All of this suggests that Task Force X is powerful enough to control Adam. Funny for you how often the only choice in killing people coincides. Dr. Fate is a man with a thousand storm clouds swirling over his head at all times. As the sentient alien helmet of Naboo he wears reveals every possible version of the future. He knows that the future is unwritten, but due to circumstances out of his control, he can't always predict which series of events will unfold. His job is to step in and make sure that the decisions made by the JSA result in the best possible outcome. Throughout much of the film, he is dreading the completion of the mission because he knows the version of events where they save the day requires his friend Hawkman to die. Nothing but heartache. When Sabak rises from the underworld to conquer Earth, fate knows the happy ending is approaching. But he's not about to let Hawkman go. He steps in and sacrifices himself. While doing so, he uses his power to be in two places at once to free Adam because he knows Adam is the only one powerful enough to defeat Sabak. He tells Adam that he should accept his abilities because fate doesn't make mistakes, and at that moment, Dr. Fate has literally chosen Adam to save humanity, whether he wants it or not. Fate's sacrifice also allows Hawkman to hold the helmet in order to multiply himself and distract Sabak, turning the tide of the battle. Despite his many faults, the antagonist of the film isn't actually Black Adam. It's a man named Ishmael. At first, he appears to be working with Adriana to help free Khan Dark, but he's actually looking for the crown of Sabak. No one really knows why he wants it, so they check the engraving within it, only to find that it reads that life is the only road to death, which seems obvious. What they don't know is that the power from the crown comes from the underworld, which serves as a dark reflection of our world. This means the inscription is really telling them that death is the only road to life. Ishmael wants the crown because he is a descendant of King Ankat and only his bloodline can wear the crown and use its power. When Ishmael gets the crown, he is killed and sent to the underworld, where six demons grant him the evil version of Black Adam's power, and he rises from that realm to command an undead army to conquer the world. Black Adam is the only one who can stop him. After briefly visiting the afterlife where his son tells him it isn't his time yet, Adam returns to Khan Dark and battles Sabak. While he handles that, ordinary citizens fight his skeleton army. Finally, Adam rips Sabak in half, destroying the crown and Sabak's power, at least freeing Khan Dark. For now, that is. We'll take care of the rest. As the dust begins to settle and everyone realizes the battle has been won, the question posed to Adam is whether or not he is willing to be Khan Dark's hero. He destroys the throne meant for their savior because it feels wrong. Even after 5,000 years of imprisonment, Adam knows that Khan Dark doesn't need a ruler. It needs people who are willing to work together to return to its former glory. Khan Dark already has heroes, he says, having met people like Adriana and her son Aman who believes in Khan Dark and want to see it thrive again. Their hearts and intentions are pure, unlike his own. This goes back to the start of the film, when her root stresses a need for everyone to stand up and fight their enslavers when everyone else is too scared. Adriana and Aman are this generation's version of her root. With Intergang gone and Sabak killed, they can organize the citizens to work together. While that's going on, Khan Dark still needs a protector, someone who can stand in the way when an invading force shows up looking to occupy them again. That is a role Adam is more comfortable with, because he still isn't one for rescuing people. 
He will not save Kondok, but he will punish and destroy anyone who thinks they can invade it. This is a sign that he is moving away from being a total anti-hero and compromising a little bit. Adam is released from his prison and enters a world already flush with superpowered beings capable of incredible feats. By the end of the film, Adam has been reborn. His suit is more vibrant, he's been encouraged by the spirit of his son to do more, and he even changes his name to Black Adam. Thus, he is more reminiscent of the character we know from the comics, a character capable of doing good, but with dubious morals and the potential to go from good to evil, depending on the situation. This is perhaps why Amanda Waller isn't very happy about him not remaining in her underwater prison. Once the end credit sequence comes to a close, we fade up to see a drone descending from the sky before Black Adam. A hologram of Amanda Waller projects from the device, and she, as usual, doesn't look very happy. She tells him that since he won't be staying in her prison, he is required to remain in Kondok. If he steps beyond its borders, she'll make sure it's the last thing he ever does. Since he isn't fond of serving a master, Adam tells her no one on Earth can stop him. She threatens to call in a favor with beings from other planets. He tells her to send them all. The hologram ends and we see Superman emerge from the shadows. He tells Adam that it's been a while since anyone has frightened the people of Earth quite as much as he has, suggesting that Black Adam's presence is akin to the arrival of Superman himself. Although he says he just wants to talk, Black Adam's penchant for foregoing discussion in favor of violence pretty much guarantees a conversation will not go well. Perhaps that means a sequel could feature a fight between Black Adam and Superman. Hopefully, a potential Black Adam 2 can also explain why Superman would do favors for someone like Waller, given her shady tactics. Perhaps she didn't send him and he really did just come to talk.